Hey, this is Dr. K from my medical school, and today we're going to discuss how to diagnose hypertension or high blood pressure. Make sure to subscribe and check out our other episodes on our YouTube channel and iTunes at iMedical School. No matter what field or role you play in medical care, diagnosing hypertension or high blood pressure is an essential skill of any clinician. In 2017, new guidelines were created by the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology addressing the proper diagnosis, classification, and treatment of high blood pressure. Today, let's review together how diagnosing high blood pressure has changed and how we can assess a person's risk for cardiovascular disease. Everything we discussed today can be found in the 2017 AHA Hypertension Guidelines, and I encourage you to review the executive summary, which I'll link in the description below. Unfortunately, high blood pressure is a leading cause of heart attack and stroke, with many adults not recognizing the severe symptoms of hypertension until it's too late. Anytime we talk about a disease process, we focus on the risk factors that tend to lead to that disease. With hypertension or high blood pressure, we break down the risk factors into two groups, those that are modifiable and those that are fixed. Modifiable risk factors means risks we can change, while fixed risk factors are difficult or impossible to change. The major modifiable risk factors include cigarette smoking, secondhand smoking, diabetes, elevated cholesterol and lipids, obesity, physical activity, and a poor diet. Fixed risk factors include chronic kidney disease, family history, older age, low socioeconomic status, male gender, obstructive sleep apnea, and stress. Today we're going to focus on how to diagnose hypertension. Diagnosing hypertension is very important because often I see this done incorrectly, even in physician offices. I'm really going to highlight the key points in diagnosis. The first step in diagnosing hypertension correctly is getting an accurate measurement. Many times when we go to an office appointment, we are rushed from the waiting room to the examination room. As soon as we sit down, a blood pressure cuff is thrown on us and commonly over our clothing or our sleeve is pushed up, squeezing our arm with a cuff just below that. I understand there are time constraints for the patient and for the clinician, but we never want to work off bad data. If you are truly concerned about someone having high blood pressure, they should be taken back to the examination room and allowed to sit in a chair for at least five minutes so that their blood pressure can go to a resting state. The patient has a duty to avoid any stimulants like coffee or heavily caffeinated drinks prior to the office appointment. Lastly, any clothing that covers or compresses the arm should be removed as this can affect the blood pressure measurement. I have the person I'm seeing rest their arm on a desk or table so they're not having to tense the arm. I put the cuff in the middle of the person's arm and try not to have any clothing under the cuff or constricting the arm. A very important point is that you need the correct cuff size. Generally, I find a cuff where the bladder of the cuff encompasses at least 80% of the circumference of the arm to be adequate. If the cuff is too loose, you will get a falsely low blood pressure. And if the cuff is too high, you will get a falsely elevated blood pressure. Place your stethoscope into the antecubital fossa or the inside surface opposite to the elbow. In one hand, you have the bulb of the cuff, which is used to inflate the cuff. And in the other hand, use your index and middle finger to palpate the pulse of the radial artery. The radial artery is on the lateral aspect of the wrist. You inflate the cuff slowly until you no longer feel the radial artery pulse. Then go about 30 millimeters of mercury past this point. Once you have reached this point, slowly deflate the cuff until you hear the first cord cough sound. This is the sound when the systolic blood pressure of the heart exceeds the pressure in the cuff. So blood is spurting through the compressed artery. You will continue to hear the sound until it disappears. And this is when the diastolic pressure is greater than the cuff pressure, allowing unimpeded flow through the artery and thus the loss of the sound of the rushing blood. Now that we've discussed how to take a blood pressure, it is important to understand what blood pressures are abnormal. There are several categories of blood pressure that we will review. 
Normal blood pressure is a systolic blood pressure less than 120 and a diastolic pressure less than 80. Elevated blood pressure is having a systolic blood pressure from 120 to 129 and a diastolic blood pressure less than 80. The elevated category is still not considered hypertension. We split hypertension into stage 1 and stage 2. Stage 1 hypertension is a systolic blood pressure from 130 to 139 or a diastolic blood pressure from 80 to 89. Stage 2 hypertension is a systolic blood pressure greater than or equal to 140 or a diastolic blood pressure greater than or equal to 90. Notice how the stage 1 and stage 2 criteria are a specific systolic range or a specific diastolic range, while the prior stages you had to meet both criteria. This helps identify those that are at higher risk for cardiovascular disease earlier to prevent complications like heart attack and stroke down the road. In addition, the major change with these new guidelines is that stage 1 hypertension is set at a lower range. In fact, current stage 2 used to be stage 1 in prior guidelines known as the JNC7. Another important point is that if someone has criteria that puts them in two different categories, they should be classified as the higher category. We should take two good readings on two separate occasions to get an accurate average blood pressure. One of the reasons for this is that some people have what is called white coat hypertension, where the blood pressure is elevated in the clinic, but not at home. Monitoring blood pressures at home is very important to differentiate if this is underlying hypertension or just anxiety causing a high blood pressure just at their appointments. Diagnosing hypertension is very important, but so is understanding someone's overall risk of developing cardiovascular complications. To help assess a person's overall risk, we have a ASCVD risk calculator to assess a person's cardiovascular risks. ASCVD stands for Atherosclerotic Vascular Disease. I include the link for the American College of Cardiology ASCVD Risk Calculator down below if you'd like to play around with it. The calculator takes into account age, gender, race, blood pressure, total cholesterol, HDL, LDL, and risk factors like smoking, diabetes, as well as if someone's on cholesterol medication to name a few. Those with an ASCVD risk of less than 5% have a low risk, and those from 5 to 7.4% have a borderline risk. Risk calculated between 7.5% to 19.9% have an intermediate risk, with those greater than or equal to 20% having a high risk of developing a cardiovascular event like a stroke or heart attack. Calculating the risk helps you look at the big picture and helps us decide whether someone needs medications to control hypertension, especially in those that may have just stage 1 hypertension. We will discuss this further in the next episode. Well, that was a review of how to diagnose hypertension. In our next video, we will discuss the basic treatment options for high blood pressure. Make sure to give us a like if this video was helpful and subscribe to learn more from our future videos. This is Dr. K from My Medical School, and I'll see you next time.